I can't tell you how many like really, really big artists are signed to labels and nobody can get them to answer the fucking phone or they'll change their number. If you want to be a great independent artist, you have to be really good at like paying the people you are now hiring because you don't want to give up a percentage of your music is difficult. But that's why the ones that succeed independently are very, very special people. How many times Rod Wave was telling me in 2017 or 2018 that like X or Y person was next and me being like, well, let's focus on you first. You know, like that was wrong. Like I had the wrong idea, you know, what would you recommend? But like signing a deal versus going independent. Yeah. I believe in working. I believe in grinding. I believe in the tunnel vision, but I also believe in like what's meant for you will be meant for you and will happen. Mm -hmm. I know you, you did some work with Virgil before, you know, his yeah. timely death. It's a really interesting story that actually I don't think anybody knows. You know, congratulations on joining Atlantic Records. Thank Your you. Director A&R over there, right? Yes. Um, man, how did that, how did that feel? Um, hmm. It, it was like a long time coming. Mm. Like, I think when it started, um, it was kind of like, I, we had already been talking about it for a really long time. I had been introduced to that team for almost two years. Um, it was a process. I was, um, you know, contractually in another situation and, and, um, and we were going back and forth for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but it felt great to start. But I think it's like, it's like, you know, going to a new school or going wow. to college for the first time. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Or like, you know, meeting a whole new group of people, a whole new system. Um, so I feel like I'm just getting started. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so there are really high highs. And then there are moments where, um, you know, I'm still learning and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, it's exciting every single day. You never know what you're going to get. Mm. It's really interesting to hear you say that it felt like going to a new school yes. for the first time because it, that's not new. That what I mean, the position might have the title of the position might have been new, but Kay. it's not new to you, right? Like you've been putting in the work for a long time. This is not that th that building might have been new, the title might have been new, yes. but the description uh, maybe a little tweak here and there, but you're pretty much familiar with the job title, right? Like yeah, absolutely. You, absolutely. So it's weird to hear you say, not weird, but it's interesting to hear you say, like, it's like going to a new, is that how you approached it? Like, this is a new opportunity, something that I have to, um, you have to find a different way to approach this, or did you kind of brought in the same mentality? I think that I've always had like a different way of doing what I do. Mm. You know what I mean? And so I think that I would like to believe that that is why you know, a, a company with that the sort of trajectory that they had brought me in because they have this, um, you know, very, uh, how do I say, like their way of working has been the same for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. And like the people that have worked there have been, you know, very similar for a very long time. Um, you know, there are certain people that have stood out and stuff like that, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. And I think, I think that, um, they were looking forward to have to bringing in somebody fresh that would stand out. You know, there's people who have worked there 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 15 years, you know, and and um, and it was just like a, it was a new start. And I think every label, every company, every manager, every artist works differently. So you have to be um, aware of that and able to uh, be flexible and be open to you know how these people work and learn and learn the psychology behind it all and why it works for them yeah know? i'm curious in what you feel like you bring you know to the table mm. aside from the skill set like i would like to say uh just like youth and fresh ideas and mm -hmm. stuff like that i'm not that young anymore though you know like I <laughs> we're creeping up there I, yeah exactly <laughs> so i would like to say that um I would like to say that traditional A and R is is much different now. It's you know very research based and stuff like that. I would I I would think that you know because of 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 having started very young, like I have this network of super you know young people and new people mm -hmm. and like maybe people that you wouldn't even think to you know go work with or an artist that you might want to go work with or a producer that you might want to go work with or somebody you're not that excited about mm -hmm. you know but that you know in your head might be really exciting in the future might 
be on the cusp of being the next something or the next somebody. So I think it's just like a different ideology, you mm -hmm. know, and it's just a completely different phone book, a completely different list of emails, a completely different list of producers, DJs, uh, you know, artists, uh, promoters, you know, like just people who you can reach out to to figure out like what's next and what's dope, you know, yeah. a, a, a connection to the youth, you know. I want to dive into what you said earlier um, about how you bring the youthfulness yes. to the company. Um, the sure. reason why I want to dive into that more because I've always heard people say hip hop is a young man's sport. Okay. Is is there some somewhat truth to that? Like, would you would you would you say that? But uh, mainly, um, the reason why I'm asking is because just over the last few years, mm -hmm. I've seen nothing but older figures in hip hop dominating from what it seems like like even if we go back to verses right it yeah. seemed like the locks just kind of are, are these older dudes in hip-hop who just kind of came out of nowhere and were showing people not came out of nowhere but like f for a while they weren't as talked about as like the youth right now and it just seemed like now they're talked about and they're in conversations it seemed like a lot of the older figures are in conversation so it makes me wonder if that statement is still true like is it still a youth uh, uh, genre like is that still the thing that's driving this you know this this hip-hop space i think a lot of these people are adapting right mm -hmm. so like they created verses from oh well, i actually don't quote me on this but like it, it was like from live and stuff like yes, that you no, know what right, i mean yeah. like things like that like um that's like something that like kids were on you know what i mean like multiple mm. people on live like that's something like kids were on you know like instagram you. like social media so like mm. when they adapted to that there's definitely older people consuming social media they actually might be consuming it more than younger people because like what are our parents doing at night on a friday saturday mm. sunday you know what i mean they're probably just on their phone like on facebook or like mm -hmm. learning how to use instagram following these nostalgic people that they you know like looked at for a long time you know what i mean seeing what they're up to and stuff like that you know mm. like tv is not that like people don't watch cable tv like that anymore mm -hmm. you know what i mean they're using their streaming services they're using social media they're using youtube and they're consuming content so i think that like if an older artist or if an older crew or if an older you know whatever started using content to their advantage like of course they're like at the forefront of it right now you know and mm -hmm. then and then by the way like their best friend's best friend is mm -hmm. now like the head at Nike or the mm -hmm. head at Bel Air or the head at, you know, like whatever fucking drink, you know, Diddy like owns or something like that. Right. So <laughs> they're like getting these one. crazy OG bags mm -hmm. where like I'm having a hard time, you know, like behind the scenes, like getting a party sponsored. Right. Mm. Because like my best friend is not the 50 plus year old person yeah, that yeah, owns yeah. that. And like our kids don't play at the park together. So he's not signing a check that fast for me. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like. Of course, they're succeeding at it. Like they have a huge, huge push. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I can. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. And that that comes from, um, I guess, the the longevity of doing this, right? You you, the people that you grow that you grow with, becomes uh, the CEO of this. Yeah, Ciroc company. They're gonna support each other. Yeah, I get that. I sure. totally get that. Yeah. I think if anything, like my age range, like twenty two to like 27 28 mm -hmm. is almost like in a really weird place right now if they don't adapt to new social media like people who aren't mm -hmm. adapting to like discord or TikTok or um you know streaming and stuff like that they're like at a they're just at like in not in the best standing as they could be like my comparison to an act who like isn't really like obsessed with social media is like yo there's a 16 year old out there or a 17 year old out there who's going on TikTok live mm -hmm. two times a day wow. on instagram live sharing snippets every day on mm -hmm. instagram live with his peers every day you know is on like discord group text with like the next 10 best playboy cardi or destroy lonely producers making music with them on discord or something wow, like yeah. that creating a subgenre of their music and like creating a community online in these apps that you don't even know how to use or you think you're too cool for using or you don't have time to use right mm -hmm. like so i actually think that like i'm in this in between stage of like the too cool for school kids you mm -hmm. know what i mean um so you know more power to you if you know how to use that no matter how old you are you yeah know? yeah Man, um, 
we're we're like racing to the conversation right now. This is good stuff, but I want to slow it down a little <laughs> okay. bit because um, I, I just want to uh, like we want to get to know you. Sure. Like I said yeah. in the beginning. Um, so from my knowledge, you started off in retail, right? Yeah. Like yes. You, yeah. Tommy yeah. Hilfiger. Yeah. You worked there. Um, yes, I did work at Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> 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 yeah, I did. Yep. And like was was retail the direction you wanted to go in at first ha, or has it always been a focus on music from the start no i wanted to uh work in fashion or okay. like be a buyer or something like that for somewhere cool like not like a department store or something like that but i wanted to work in the business of fashion yes mm, what was I, I mean you can tell like you're you love sneakers and you love yes. uh, clothing so when did the 360 happen? Like, when did it switch? Um, I didn't get into any <laughs> schools. Wow. I didn't get into any fashion schools. Yeah. Like, uh, my portfolio was just pretty basic. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. and, and I attribute that to just um, probably not having, like, the correct exposure to, like, what actually was cool. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I was just obsessed with Instagram, and I thought whatever was there was, like, what was next or what mm. was trending or whatever and so like that was pretty much like what i based all my like essays and portfolios and stuff off of and i think there's definitely like a different technical and and like a different study and like everything that like these kids who really eat sleep and breathe like real fashion mm-hmm. um you know deserve to be there and i think that you probably are going to say it like I went to art high school and I was a music major. Mm -hmm. So it was like my easy way into college, like just music. And I didn't want to be a performing artist. I despised playing the double bass, but I got into school because of it. And so that labeled me like music business. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, what the fuck is that? And we'll get into that, you know, and you can say you can apply the same uh, sentiment to music. Also, like the people who live, eat, sleep, you know, fashion or the things online or into the fashion and yeah. same with music, right? That yeah. th- those are what makes the, the people who are good at what they do in music is because they live, eat, sleep, this. True. Did that, w- did you notice that becoming a thing for you or did that, was that a habit that formed I over think time? It was always intertwined, right? Okay. I just grew up like in music more, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So maybe it was like easier for me to digest and like mm. understand, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, um, I mean, I, I, I wasn't going to take it. I know you went to um, you went to college, but I know you also dropped out also. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, I did. Yes. I didn't I, go to I didn't college for very that. long. <laughs> I didn't want to bring that. No, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. It's okay. What was the decision behind uh, dropping out? It actually was not a decision. It wasn't something that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I just didn't have time for that anymore. And like, I was just going to like the cheapest school, Mm -hmm. like taking the most basic classes. And I just, just ain't nobody had time for that at that point, bro. Like I was on tour, I was like moving around and I was like in that mode. Like I was in that tunnel vision mode where like, this is what mattered to me. Mm -hmm. Like nothing else mattered to me. You know what I mean? And so when I was super aware that like, I would have no support from my family, like in any sort of way Mm -hmm. if I dropped out. And so I calculated it like, okay, this is like projectile, how much I'm going to make. This is how much I need to save. And this is how much I can't be spending Mm -hmm. to continue to, to, to do this thing that I'm passionate about for X amount of time. Um, if I drop out and my family chooses not to talk to me or help me anymore, you know what I mean? And that's actually exactly what happened, you know? A lot of creative people drop out of college. There's always that conversation, you know, about how super creative minds often didn't stick around in the formal education system. They did it their own way. Look at Shakespeare, look at Oprah, Jay-Z, Drake, and even Steve Jobs. They weren't exactly the classroom heroes, right? They were out here taking risks, not scared of what people thought, and hustling hard to make their ideas happen. But not everyone's a Jay-Z, not everyone's an Oprah, not everyone's a Steve Jobs. 
times. Not everyone's a Drake. I'm sorry to tell you. So that's why college is necessary. Regardless if you know what you want to do or not, because it's better to be productive in college than to just moving around and wasting time outside of college. It's about being willing to take risks, in all honesty. All right, let's get back to the conversation. So you, do you do you not come from a creative family? Oh, no, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, my my what father was a musician. Oh, yes. Wow, yeah. My father was... Um, he was a um, like his his work his trade was IT so he did like IT like at schools and stuff like that like mm -hmm. computer technician, but he was a musician, a, a incredible musician played a lot of instruments, um, you know traveled playing music and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I do want to stress this too, man. Um, I do apologize for your loss. I know your father passed away, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. How, how much did that weigh on you? when that happened um i think actually what it did was it created a sense of like um like nothing is really that important you know what i mean like in Explain the sense more. i was chasing like i was chasing life in la or i was chasing you know like like comparing myself in social media and being like, I need to get here by this age, or I need to get here by this age, or I need to live with these people, or I need my, my, you know, following to be here or my bank account to be here or my clients to be doing X, Y, or Z thing. And, um, and I realized that like, it's really, really, really important to just take a second and breathe and do like what you love and wow. check on yourself and be like am i good or are the people around me like good and like i believe in working i believe in grinding i believe in the tunnel vision but i also believe i also believe in like yo just chill and like understand that like what's meant for you will be meant for you and will happen mm -hmm. But don't do too much because I, from one day to the other, something like this, like tragedy could hit you the way it hit me. Mm -hmm. And then you got to like, whoa, like you got to slow down, you know what I mean? And like and deal with it in a completely different way, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's interesting you said that because I think you shared before that um, you actually didn't get the chance to do that. As soon as that happened, you went straight to work. Was that your way of dealing with it? Uh, or you mean I, when my when dad, passed, dad away? passed you said you went straight to work like you went back to work yeah I went right back to LA as soon as he passed mm -hmm. and then and then I think like my actions um, and the, like the way I would react to things and stuff like that were um, indicative of like or you should like go home and like handle the things you can handle mm -hmm. from home and like whoever's not happy about that can deal with that on their own but like you need to deal with yourself and your family and like the things that are immediately important yeah so, yeah what are some memories man that you remember with him with my dad yeah oh we had a super positive relationship wow. he was like a super supporter yeah. um he gave me like a lot of great advice you mm -hmm. know what i mean and i think he is like the type of person that's like i don't want you to be like me i want you to be better than me you yeah. know what i mean and he instilled that thought process on me like for everybody like all my you know young friends or like kids that you know want to work and stuff like that I, like they're like oh i want to be like him like, i don't want you to be like me at all like i want you to be better <laughs> right. than me you know what i mean like surpass me mm -hmm. use me as a vessel to be bigger and better every time yeah. um uh, super humble like remain humble like you know like taught me about humility a lot like not everything is about like money like sometimes we are doing a deed because it's i think it's it's what god um you know wants us to do it's like what we it's it's how we pay you know you know pay the world back and in in and how everything comes together you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying like it, it can be little things you know like opening doors or you know helping somebody get signed and you don't make anything for it or anything you know whatever you know it's like you're just doing it because that's your calling and uh, if you're passionate about something you're going to do it and you're going to do it well yeah <laughs> yeah so I, I just spoke to someone and I was telling him similar sentiments. I was like, yeah. um, I think our purpose in life is to be a service to other people. And that service looked different, you know, where, depending on the industry that yeah, you're going totally. through. Yeah, totally. You know, like you said, um, getting somebody signed and, um, you know, whether you gain from it or not, it's still a service in a way, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're doing something for someone. I, I think that's the easiest way for me to break a service down. But I think that's what we're here for on this earth is you know to be service to other people and 
like I said, depending on the industry you're in, that looks completely different. Yeah. Um, but, you know, back to your dad, I know, and I, I, I don't want to, you know, have you keep living on uh, or reliving, you know, the memory. But I just I remember you sharing that, you know, the, the I think the last time y'all were together mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. when y'all were, you know, you were hanging up plaques in your. Yeah, room. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was wow. like shortly. Yeah. That must have been a, that, that. So when I when I saw that, I was yeah. like, wow, like you're at things are going great in your life. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that happens. That must yes. have been that, I, I don't even know emotionally how you were able to deal with that. Like, OK, so because your career is doing good at this time. right? Yeah. It's like. Mm -hmm. It was like it was a it was a moment that I wish I would have maybe embraced a little bit more. Mm hmm. Um, when you, and you know, I don't want this to trigger anybody or anything like that. Right. But when you are at that stage of your depression and you're living with somebody at that stage of their depression, you almost become insensitive to that stage of their depression. Right. So mm -hmm. our every day we sp I spent every day together with him throughout whatever he was dealing with mm -hmm. until the week I was gone and uh, you know, that's when he passed away. But it's almost like everything that happens is like robotic, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And like, okay, yeah, this person wakes up, sits down, watches TV for X amount of hours. You eat, you watch TV and then you go to sleep. You know what I mean? And then this person can't sleep and you can sleep. So that's like the one piece, the piece you get, you know what I mean? But it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like you be, you're like, you, you don't sit there and you feel bad every day or, you know, you do, but you're not like, talking through these things or whatever you're just kind of like you're living in a space with this person you know wow. and so this is something that changed that specific day because it wasn't you know like I, I knew they were coming but that you know they take a really long time to get made and they <laughs> take a really long time to come so i wasn't really following on them up on them and, and and when they showed up they all showed up at the same time and I think it was really exciting for the both of us. Wow. And I think it was like one of the last times that um, we shared uh, like a happy emotional moment, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And he, he, you know, he told me he was very proud of me and he made a post online and, um, and yeah, that was a, that was a good moment for yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure. And I want to uh, salute your family too. Cause I know, you know, y'all, did a fundraiser for you know people that yeah 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 depression. yeah we did yes 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 we did yes I, I i still do like whenever i can you yeah. know um you i i don't want to be like a broken vinyl like ever you know what i mean but mm -hmm. i think that it's always like the first thing that comes to mind like if i'm gonna collect for anything it'll probably be for that yeah yeah mm -hmm. Yo, it's so important to have each other's back. I think I've said this multiple times on this podcast. Like, you never know what someone's going through, right? They might be putting on a brave face, but inside, they're struggling big time. So, being there for them, showing some love and support, it can make a world of a difference. Even the smallest things, like listening to them when they need to talk or checking in on them, can mean everything. It's like being that shining light in their dark tunnel. We all need a little help sometimes. And giving back to someone dealing with depression can be that helping hand they desperately need to get through tough times. That's why I commend Mateo and his family for what they're doing with their mental health program and helping giving back to people dealing with depression. Let's get back to the interview. It's totally okay. Like, by the way, guys, if you ever deal with something traumatic, like go to therapy, like go to the gym, meditate, like you'll be all right. Like you'll get through it. Be close with your family. Like, you know, um, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna I, I've, I've taken every step necessary. You know wow. what I mean? I can talk about this. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. How does a young man in West Palm beach started planning events and putting mm. all these concerts and stuff together? How did that even get started? I was going to shows in Miami. Mm -hmm. So back then like X ski smoke perp, Denzel Curry, who uh, even earlier than that, like Raider Clan stuff. Um, man, there was just like a lot of events going on down there. A wow. lot, a yeah. lot of small things, big things, everything in between. You know what I mean? And like people were starting oh to God. come. <laughs> I like, wouldn't be me if I didn't pause that. 
I would not be me. Wow. I, didn't I, didn't think I had about to that. pause that. I, was, I didn't think wow. about that. You <laughs> said a lot of small like things, this, a lot yeah. of big things. That was crazy. Wow. Mattel. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We was having a good no, moment cool. and I ruined it. <laughs> no, I was just. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I wouldn't be me if I didn't do that. I feel it. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> Um, so all yeah. different sorts of events were going on. <laughs> all different sorts Good of things of were words. happening. Um, how did I start? I started following like kids on Instagram who like had followers and like things going on, you know. And and uh, I just got a car. And whenever they were like, I need an assistant or I need a photographer or I need this or I need that, I would always be like, Yep, I'm down the street, like ten minutes away. Mm-hmm. I was not ten minutes away. I was maybe like sixty to seventy five <laughs> minutes away. Wow um you know in the two counties over in west palm you know so but i would were drive willing to take that drive <laughs> oh yeah every time yeah. yeah and i would go to these events and became like obsessed with these events every weekend i would go to an, an event or two or three and i would lie to my parents too and be like oh i'm just like at a friend's house i'm gonna sleep over or, like you know anything whatever and eventually like i became like friends with a lot of the people that were participating in these events mm-hmm. and that were you know uh gaining a following and gaining a lot of traction and stuff Mm -hmm. like that you know um so i had a lot of friends from like the sneaker community and stuff like that like kids who you know were starting to like invest their money in shoes and were now looking to maybe like do different things um and so i remember the first time i had a friend named patrick patrick francavilla he was like yo we should do a show with like all these kids that you go see in Miami. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's really like what I want to do and stuff like that. He was like, I promise you it's going to do really well. He's like, you have a great network of people here. Like, you know, the kids over there, like, you know, get in touch with somebody and try to get some artists booked. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we can split the costs or I'll put up the money. And I was like, okay, we'll all handle the production, like finding the artists, finding the venue, like doing the flyers, whatever, um, and the promotion. And he was like, all right, cool. So at the time I was really close to, I still am, uh, to Rojas on the beat. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a hold on, you know, like XXX and Ski Mask and people like that. And I also knew Tarek, um, shout out Tarek from Rolling Loud. And he was managing uh, Wi-Fi's funeral at that time. Wi-Fi's funeral is from West Palm Beach. So Mm -hmm. he was like the biggest thing back then over there. You know what I mean? Uh, So that's like the first thing we did, you know, and the club I found through my dad, like my dad was playing at like every venue in West Palm Beach and mm-hmm. they were usually Latin nights and Latin venues and stuff like that. So like I would just talk to the venue owners, like maybe he would help me or like his friends would help me. And that's how it kind of got started. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Wi-Fi name because mm-hmm. there was a, I, I think a, a story that was told is that you were on the musical end and he made you look into the business side of things. Is that how it went? Oh, f- wow um he was starting a rap group i guess you Mm -hmm. know what i mean but it it wasn't really like that like he (laughs) was he was starting a rap group and i was like cool like i'll rap with you like and he was like okay great and i went to his house and i had no idea what like what was going on you know and he said something to me like yo like you're smart like you can go be a lawyer or something if you want like I have music like my mom knows I have music this is all I have I have music and I was like okay like it put it uh, something into perspective you know what I mean I I never followed up on like making music with him or anything like Mm -hmm. that after the fact but we were always close and um through him you know when he got signed and stuff like that I learned about like the people making his music like producing for him and stuff like Mm -hmm. that and that's how I really, like, really got into the business, yes. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's kind of like uh, people always say, um, you know, how we have to have these conversations with, with artists or, or rappers in the community because everybody wants to be rappers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like you got to have these tough conversations. In a way, that was kind of the conversation. But it's not that you, you had aspirations of being a musical artist. It was mm-hmm. just a moment, the thing that, that, that happened. But Oh, yeah. Um, do you um do you did you have any mentors around this time that you were doing this did you reach out to any mentors to um get you started or to pick their brains i definitely reached out to a lot of people well how did those conversations went uh like unavailable you know what i mean yeah 
I had young peers and stuff who were like maybe you know beginning to move and shake around and stuff like all the whole rolling loud crew like shout mm-hmm. out to them like they were all really great always like I started doing content like shooting content I started like shooting videos mm-hmm. and photos and stuff like that and they were always like okay cool you can come like we'll give you a pass or shooting their concerts and stuff like that so yeah. I can't really say mentors I think there was people that I looked up to you know um and people that I met early who like maybe like managed artists from outside of the city or something like that where I was like oh wow like this is cool like you have like you're like a real manager because now (laughs) you're like you know bringing flying people in and doing things like that so um uh Toby from Stomp Down who manages Maxo Cream um Sarah Corinne Sarah Corinne I want to say is her last name I it is it's it's Sarah Corinne Sarah Corinne and she has a sec another last name um but she um works with Rolling Loud and like uh, does a lot of like uh weed activations and stuff with them but back Mm -hmm. then she was doing like a lot of like A3C shows and like uh things like that and she would bring me along you know to shoot content and Mm -hmm. stuff like that so I was able to like meet a lot of artists through her and stuff like that yes so you know we fast forward life and you're working at at Interscope yes you're working at Alamo Records yes um you spent four years at Interscope I believe right and five at Alamo I, I, well, my timeline uh, uh, might be a little different, but uh, Alamo was it in the system, you know? So oh, it's yeah. all under the branch. Yes, yes. See, yes. Th- those are the things that I think the average people don't know. Like, right? I, I think a late like we think of you know Universal, and then there's just like a bunch of branch under mm-hmm. Universal. Um, but how um, how did that process look like getting to to Interscope? Um. Was it a difficult one? Was it um, no. a lot of like reaching out to different people? How did that look like? First of all, I had to learn what the fuck A and R was. I didn't wow. know that that was a job. I didn't know that that's something people did. Mm-hmm. I was gonna either like throw concerts or hopefully learn how to be a manager. Like that was my, you know, that was what like my idea of like what I wanted to do was mm-hmm. right. I was still working retail. Um, then I learned about that. Someone called me and was like, hey, would you ever be down to like consult or intern or like do something at this label? And I was like, I don't know like what that means. And then they explained to me like, yo, A&R finds acts early, reaches out to them. It's like the first person to establish like a real relationship with them and their team. And then eventually, like if, you know, if things work out and look correctly, you know, you sign them to a label and you work with them throughout their label career. Um, And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Um. The first person to help me get into the doors at Alamo Interscope was Joey Walker, um, who had the brand Daily Chiefers, or has the brand Daily Chiefers. And uh, he was the first person actually to start working at Alamo Records. And this all happened because I tweeted um, and tagged, that's so embarrassing, I tweeted (laughs) and tagged Todd Moskowitz, and I was like, hey, you're signing a lot of artists from Florida, you should hire some people from florida um and then think (laughs) right and then um and then kelvin lee who works at you know rolling loud is one of the you know head talent bookers and stuff like that over there tagged joey walker and he was like you know this kid works with him and i started dming him every single day like hey what do you think about this what do you think about that i'm friends with this person i'm friends with that person like and then i started being like i'm gonna move to new york 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 and um wi-fi just did his deal there i started working with his producer chris De Niro on mm-hmm. like a management type of thing help him do like admin and management and um and this kid was like gonna get paid for his beats and we were like wow like you're gonna get paid for your beats that's crazy and um we flew up there around the same time that he was up there doing press and stuff um up where new york to new york yeah okay. up here yes and um, and that's when we were able to, that's how I was able to get in the building, through them, you know what I mean? And yeah. I never left their side. Like I was with them every day they were doing their press runs, like sometimes staying at their Airbnb or like whatever, whatever it took to continue to be in that building, like I was in that building. And then after they left, I was already like close with everybody in the building. So mm-hmm. they were like, oh, just come, just come. And, and then d- it just, it was a snowball effect. Yeah, it was like a super natural flow, but like, Mind you, like I was there in the morning, like two or three hours. Wow. And then I would go to work at Ralph Lauren. And then I would go to school. 
and I would Damn. do it every day. You know what I mean? Damn. Yeah. Were, they, were they paying you at this time? No. Or you were just volunteering your No, time? I was just going there. Wow. I actually was just going there. Like, they didn't even ask me to go there. I was just going, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think, actually, they made me an ID on some, like, you can come here if you want. So I was able to just come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. Because you, you were showing up so much, they just made you an ID. Yeah, they made wow. me an ID. And then I think one day they were like, hey, um, do you want to, like, consult? Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they paid me, like, a, like a nominal fee, like something. You yeah. know what I mean? And I was like, yeah. Yo, gang, listen up. Working internships for free might not seem like the coolest thing to do, but trust me, it's about the long-term game, you feel me? It's not about the cash in your pocket right now. It's about scoring those sweet opportunities that could set you up big time in the future. Internships give you that chance to learn the ropes, make connections with the big shots in the industry, and show off your skills in the real world. It's like getting a sneak peek behind the scenes and getting the hands-on experience that no classroom can give you plus if you hustle hard show them what you're made of it could open some serious doors for you like landing that dream job or getting some killer recommendations that'll make your resume pop so even though it might not pay right away those internships can be the ticket to making those big dreams of yours become a reality let's get back to the interview do you see that kind of work ethic now that I think people say when, when I speak to the older generation, they say our generation lacks that kind of work ethic. Like we don't have that mindset anymore to want something that much that will do it for free. You know what? I want to say no. I want to say I don't see it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also be why there's not 7000 people doing what we do right in front of us every single day. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's definitely a grind and it definitely might feel like like you're exploiting somebody or like abusing somebody's time or whatever the case may be. But like the people who go through that will end up winning at the end of the day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether it's making content or whether it's, uh, you know, connecting producers with artists or whether it's literally just being like a great vibe in the studio for somebody, you know what I mean? Or like creating relationships or, you know, driving people around or whatever if you withstand like this trial, like mm. you're, you're going to end up doing okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's always uh, w what's that phrase where they say something on the other side of the rainbow. <laughs> what is that phrase? Like it's always sunny on, si on the other side of the something rainbow like or something that. like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to when I, when we first started the interview, you know, I congratulated you on um, joining Atlantic records Thank you. Uh, with the senior A in our position. But there was something in your announcement statement that I would like for you to expound on. You said, and I'll read it to you. You said you want to cultivate an artist to label experience like no other. Like yes. I'm curious, what does that mean? What, like ex expound on that. What does an artist to label relationship looks like? What does that mean? I think a lot of people look to, uh, to my accolades and definitely put like, a and R before manager, you know what I mean? Or like A and R before ally or like A and R before, um, you just friend, you know what I'm saying? And I think that we are so hyper-focused on like selling and research and like a hit and like putting pressure on an artist to be like the best so fast that I think we're forgetting about like nurturing a real relationship and and just being really cool with them throughout their process and help them maneuver what that may be right and hopefully because you've been great to them and because you know you've spent time with them and because you've spent time educating them on 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 things they might have never heard of if they never left like tupelo mississippi or something like that mm -hmm. right um you know, they'll like you. And when they get really big and famous, they'll pick up the phone because I can't tell you how many like really, really big artists are signed to labels and nobody can get them to answer the fucking phone or they'll change their number. And every person will be like, do you have this person's number? Did you get it yet? Like, oh no, we only talk like whenever he messages me like on Instagram or something like that, right? Like, and that's no diss. It's just like, yo, like we need to stop putting so much pressure on artists to be perfect and just be allies. Um, obviously we want to help them succeed, but you know, just be an ally and just nurture a really good relationship so that you have a real relationship and not just a working one, you know? Mm. So you're saying basically you wanted to create, you want to create an environment where is a, a personal connection between you and the artist instead of just business. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 
Ah. And that can turn into business and that can turn into like believing like if you told me like, yo, this kid is next, bro. Like, you know, he's he's next. OK, cool. Like, let me teach you what that means to tell me that somebody is next and me being able to mm. to provide this person with resources and you already being provided with those resources, how you can provide him resources and we all be a part of a bigger business. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, I don't want to like air anybody's information out, but like how many times Rod Wave was telling me in 2017 or 2018 that like X or Y person was next and me being like, well, let's focus on you first. You know, like but that was wrong. Like I had the wrong idea, you know not going to school taught me to learn by trial and error right and so like i've taken really specific note of like everything that i haven't done correctly so that the next go around this go around hopefully we can do it the right way yeah um and just since we're on the topic of labels yeah um i am curious you know in 2023 with the evolution of like the social media sure all the platforms that we have yeah you know i i, I do wonder if you think um a record label is still you know, the traditional metric for becoming a successful um, artist or is there an alternative like being independent? Does that if you want to do great independently, mm -hmm. you have to be really, really self-sufficient and you have to be very, very coordinated and strict and like like or like willing to struggle like a lot and take the long road, you know, like. If you want to have a great body, you have to wake up at five in the morning and go run and go work out and you have to eat food that I probably wouldn't enjoy very much. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I see it. If you want to be a great independent artist, you have to be really good at like paying the people you are now hiring because you don't want to give up a percentage of your music. You have to be really good at releasing things. You have to be really good at nurturing rela relationships. You have to be really good at listening to who, who you have decided is your team. You have to be really good at who is that team finding who that team mm -hmm. is you have to be really good at um you know putting the right content out and figuring out what works and what doesn't work for you you have to be really good at a lot of things self sustainability yeah. is like is is difficult but that's why the ones that succeed independently are mm -hmm. very very special people and i think it, hopefully you get to talk to a lot of them um you know moving forward and you'll see like why they might be like the chosen ones for real yeah yeah <clears throat> like they have a it's a i, I don't want to say chico because i don't think chico is the word but it's just your their, their mindset is completely different than you know the one as somebody who you know who does go with a with a label because like you said it is, it's difficult being independent um but the reason i'm glad we're we, we're bringing up independent because you did make a tweet um a while ago and it's nothing bad <laughs> okay uh but i just i think there's a lot to to talk about mm -hmm, on that tweet mm -hmm. because independent is definitely a word that's been thrown around loosely just over the last decade yes <laughs> and i think a lot of artists are not really representing um or they're just not accurately telling the full story behind independency so right. um you said there's labels backed by majors that boost being that boast being fully independent, um, and I want to. I, I strongly want to believe that that's applicable to artists as well. Like, do you feel that way, having that experience now in the industry? Do you think it's the same? Do you think there's artists that are backed by these majors but front the independent route? Um a really good question yeah definitely I mean it just depends the type of deal you do and like what you what you consider independent right like mm -hmm. is independent like I own my master so that makes me independent or like I've licensed my deal or like I'm still independent because I I'm only under a distribution deal or a production deal. Like, by the way, if you have an investor, you are no longer independent. You're paying somebody back yeah. and they're depending on you to succeed so they can get their investment back. Mm -hmm. Whatever the term independent means is like exactly what that means. Like we, we can Google it. Yeah. If I gave you $10,000 right now to go shoot a music video and put out a record and promote it, you just depended on me. Yes. You are not independent. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's my definition. 
No, I I see where you're coming from. I think I think the idea of uh, like ownership. I think that's where people come from. When when they say ownership, they think I'm independent because I own 100 percent of this. But I don't think a lot of people own everything that they think that they own because even something as simple as uh, this this is not even on the label side. This sure. is just youtube <laughs> yeah you're, you don't you even know, own yeah, your, yeah, yeah, <laughs> your youtube yeah. channel like youtube can literally say today i'm gonna strike you <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying or i'm gonna take away you your monetization monetize. yep so it's like that the idea of we own everything it's not as real as people think it is but people are so fascinated by it because i think some people are pushing this um this fantasy of independency and they're not telling the full story. And so um, people are buying into that and they're believing this, oh, I can be independent. But like you just broke down to us that I didn't even know, like it takes a lot to be independent. Um, oh yeah. And that was like a s super basic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that that's interesting what would you what would you recommend like as somebody who's been in the business what would you recommend so signing with a major record label can be like hitting a jackpot in the music world it's not just about the fame and the bling it's about getting the big time support and resources to take your career to the next level these labels got the connections they got the big bucks they know how to push your tracks out there to the masses they can hook you up to the best producers and promote your stuff like crazy they got the marketing game on lock so your jam could be all over radio and streaming platforms reaching way more ears than you could on your own it's like having a whole squad backing you up making sure your music gets the love and attention it deserves but here's what mateo who's an a r at a major label has to say regarding this let's go i think you should probably do a deal why do I think you should probably do a deal? Because there is like a plethora of other things you can do mm -hmm. that you can own a majority stake in that might actually make you even more money than your deal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like use that deal to skyrocket yourself, your career, your opportunities, the quality of music you're going to make, the quality of content you're going to put out, right? Um, and then... I don't know, sell t-shirts, socks, start a brand, do a partnership with a company. You know what I'm saying? Like use some of that money and invest it into something, you know, like you can create a lot of other businesses, you mm -hmm. know, like this is just one of your businesses, right? Do whatever, you, whatever else you can do, yeah. you know? Do you have this conversation a lot uh, with different, with artists a lot? Like this independent? Um, I'm not an advocator for, for like, like being independent like mm -hmm. i really am not i think that everybody needs a partner i think that everybody should learn how to be a team player i'm 100 i'm 100 whether that's <laughs> with a major label or yeah. a distributor or mm -hmm. a management company that will front you something for services or an investor or a brand like i am a strong believer in like like give up something to gain a lot more you yeah. know yeah yeah, I think um, even you brought up a great point, you know, whether that's a distributor, um, in a sense, you can paint that as independence, right? But, you know, it's still... Sure, call it whatever you want to <laughs> call it. I'm going to call bullshit. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, why do you call bullshit on that? Huh? Why do you call bullshit on that? Because, yeah, call it whatever you're going to call it. Call yourself <laughs> independent. You're depending on somebody to do something for you. Thank you. I'm glad somebody within the system is finally saying it because I've been trying to say this for as long as I can, but people somehow believe that even if you're doing a distribution deal, it's still independent. No. <laughs> no. I'm not going to say names because um, mm -hmm. um, just – for respect for everyone but um this whole conversation the reason why i brought this up yeah. is because i just i don't know if you saw the article complex put out about um i have it right here so i'll just i'll, I'll name the headline but you know complex said no hip-hop album or song has hit number one um which they said is the first in 30 years yeah i um, saw that how do you interpret that as an a and r um like first of all we are in june okay mm. we've got six months left in the year um i think that dsp's billboard like all these 
places are making it harder than ever to go number one, first of all. I think that, especially in our space, it's harder than ever to go number one. Um, because when Taylor drops, Taylor's going to drop, okay? Like Taylor Swift is going to drop and, and they're going to make sure she goes number one. You know what I mean? And her fans are going to buy physical to make sure she's number one. And she's going to line things up perfectly to make sure she's number one. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But like respectfully, like Cardi hasn't dropped yet, right? Uzi hasn't dropped yet. Um, has YB dropped? Has Young Boy dropped? I don't know if he's he dropped. did. He okay, did. Okay, Young Boy around dropped. the same time. I think Dirk when Dirk dropped. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I think that. I think that the urban artist right now like wants to like gets to a point. And then they say, well, I'm just going to turn my album in, like, just like how Kanye does, you know, like a day before. And like, hopefully that shit works or something like that. Like, there's no real like. A label will tell you they created this huge rollout. Like, no, they're just playing catch up with an artist who's like on tour all over the world and like answers the phone once a week. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and like get, and somehow he manages to show up to a video shoot and then they're, they're like spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on digital marketing and stuff like that. Um, I don't see it as, as good or bad. I actually, actually, maybe I do see it as good because like maybe now we can open up our minds and eyes and ears to like, hey, let's figure out how to collaborate with pop acts, with country acts, with dance acts, with Latin acts, with other things that are going to help create new fan bases. Like, yes, people are listening to other things. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Some people seem to blame that on the acts. Like, I, I read somewhere where someone said... <sighs> yeah, um, yeah, I already know what you're about to say. And, yeah. like, I've been seeing this shit all over the place. Um, I'm not going to cut you off. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, please, go ahead. First of all, like, a majority of the people that have been saying this are lovers of R&B. Like, that's the number one thing I'm going to say. Like, people who, like, really like R&B or, like, people above the age of, like, 35 or 37. Like, um, I don't know. Like, I don't, I, I really don't know what to say about it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I was never, like, the person that was, like, I need to go number one. Like, I never thought about that. I need to have a great career. I need to have a long-lasting career. I need mm -hmm. to make sure that everything around me is good business, thriving business, you mm -hmm. know, like that's what matters to me. Yeah. I need to have a dedicated fan base. Maybe my fan base isn't the fan base that's going to bring me to number one, but maybe my fan base will buy tickets for the next 20 years mm -hmm. and I'll have a career post trying to go number one, you know, like it's okay. I don't know. I think it's okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the I mean that's a great point. The route I was I was gonna take was uh, you know I saw somebody posted. They said um, you know eighty five percent of the artists these days are just viral sensation turned into artists, and the labels aren't developing pure talents anymore. Um, so is there a disconnect okay. between the the pure talents and you know the the record labels? Like is the, is, is that a thing or are people from the outside not even understanding what's really going on yeah i mean sometimes because data is so like in front of you and so comparable that yeah for sure mm -hmm. but it's going to take a lot longer to get a number one out of a pure talent with mm. no following or no monthly listeners or like no plan you know like there's a lot of great people that are really talented you know mm -hmm. but like um and I think maybe like if your data isn't there, but there's like a lot of things that are there, like people should take risks, of course, a hundred percent. But people want to blame the label, but we're not looking to the DSP. You know, we're mm -hmm. not being like, well, if you look at rap caviar, or if you look at the SoundCloud top fifty all genres, or mm -hmm. if you look at um, today's top hits, or uh, rap life on Apple Music, or whatever, um, don't get mad at me. Um, you know, like they're all label dominated. Yeah. Even SoundCloud is label dominated, right? Because you can pay for, you yeah. know, on SoundCloud. Things are changing. Now, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it used to not be that, you exactly. know, mm -hmm. especially SoundCloud, especially it was SoundCloud. not label nominated. Uh, it was not label dominated, right? This is all label dominated. What's in front of me is 
the biggest and best playlist. That's mm -hmm. what's in front of me. What's in front of me is a SoundCloud top 50. What's in front of me is rap caviar or get turn or whatever. Most of these playlists are label dominated, mm -hmm. right? Um, shout out to the ones that aren't like fresh finds and, um, mm -hmm. you know, now, um, you know, SoundCloud has specific playlists or they have the kids take over playlist, which is somebody who's finding like a lot yeah. of dope unsigned talent, you know, shout or, to kids or, 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 you know, like, you can send him things and, mm -hmm. and, and he'll, you know, make it a point to like showcase that. Uh, there's a definite like new and hip hop on Apple music. You know what I'm saying? Like the, I think the curators like are trying to do a good job. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But like what's consumed by the general public is what's right in front of us. And these playlists and these like alternative things are not right in front of us. They're yeah. like, you got to really look for them. Yeah. Is, is that is that helpful like is that helpful to the genre the um i don't think it makes it like a lot easier for somebody who really is talented and trying to grow mm. to blow up and i think it actually makes it harder for them to like gain like a real and dedicated fan base because when you teach somebody to focus on the numbers or to beat their numbers out and and maybe they had like a really great single release and it was like lined up perfectly and they had like a social media moment. So they got 10 editorial playlists on their release and like the next one doesn't get that and their streams like drop drastically. Mm -hmm. Then they're like, fuck, like what am I doing wrong? And then they stop promoting, they stop, you know, doing everything yeah. you're supposed to do when you're on a high yeah. and now you're at a really low low. Um, I don't know. I think we all have to change with the times and like be okay with what's happening. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, um, you you mentioned earlier about taking risk. Yeah. Uh, I I wonder about your thoughts on when Capitol Record signed the uh, the AI FM Mecca. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Did yeah. you have any any um, thoughts on that? Mm. I don't really pay much attention, honestly. I think that's mm -hmm. what the thought I had. If there was an opinion, I just like kind of just looked at it and kept it moving. Mm -hmm. It was nothing. I gained nothing from that and I learned nothing from that. And it just, it, it, it seemed to me like they didn't really have like a great, um, there wasn't really great repercussions to what happened with that. So I don't know. Yeah. This is what it is. Well, I wouldn't want to spend too, too much time on it. Um, yeah. We um, was about to wrap up here pretty soon, but I, I wanted to touch on a couple of important things sure, yes. that I thought was standout moments of your life. Like the beginning of the show, I brought up the sneakers um, and Virgil, I know you, you did some work with Virgil before, you know, his yeah. untimely death. But yeah. do you want to uh, just kind of explain on what what it was that y'all worked yeah, it's on? Yeah, it's a really interesting story that actually I don't think anybody knows. I don't really talk about it that much. Do you um, care to share? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I was a kid in Florida. Like, I went to every Art Basel since I was, like, 15 years old probably. Mm -hmm. And at one of them, um, Little Pump was starting to go up. And we did a party with uh, No Wave. And No Wave had like a party they did with Converse. No Wave was like a media platform. They did like radio stuff and parties and collabs with brands and stuff like that. Uh, this was when uh, like No Vacancy and Denim Tears and, wow. and Brock Corson were like DJing parties and events and stuff like that. They booked Lil Pump to go perform in this house that Converse paid for and that like ASAP Rocky and Bari and all these people were staying at. And the guy that was like coordinating this was this guy named Despot. Despot is like a New York staple rapper, um, old school guy, you know what I mean? But he has a lot to do with all this cultural stuff. Like mm -hmm. he's like a background of like a lot of this cultural stuff, like No Wave and him separately, you know, are all super tapped in with Supreme and with Tremaine and with Brock and with ASAP and with Bari and like all this stuff, you know, so I met him. I had heard about him. I heard about him through Wiki, um, the rapper, you know, okay. and yeah. um, they had songs together and stuff. So that's how I heard about him. And so I came up to him. We started talking a lot. We got linked up. And um, s the next day I was just walking around and my friend was smoking a blunt and some guy comes up to my friend and he's like, yo, can I hit your blunt or can I get a lighter or something like that? And we were like, yeah. They were like, what are you guys doing? We are like, oh, like, we throw shows or something like that. I don't know. We said that. And he was like, cool. Like, I work for Pepsi. Like, hit me up. Like, email me. Like, if you ever, like, need anything. Like, I do events here. Like, we're going to do an event in Miami 
next like in like a couple months like why don't you guys help me buy some talent or something like that mm. and we were like fuck yeah like we just conned ourselves into like telling this guy <laughs> that we're like talent buyers in miami right um shout out to michael monahan he still works um in new york i believe he works for like cheetos doritos like that whole thing like um and he does like music activations really cool guy uh, we worked for like months, 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 months trying to buy talent in Miami. Nothing got approved. And then he hits me up one day like, oh, I'm working on Coachella. And I was like, well, what are you working on? And he was like, I want to get talent to do this uh, Mountain Dew party that we're doing at Coachella. Like we bought out a motel doing this thing. I was like, cool. I presented him with like a ton of rap options. And then I was like, maybe you can get this guy, Virgil Abloh, like from from Bintrill, who was like DJing. And he was like, yeah, they want to do that. Like, they want to do that. And I was like, okay, I could get him. He was like, okay, how much do you think he'd want? And I was like, I have no idea, right? <laughs> but I did know at that time, I already knew, like, how to email an agent and how to, like, email a manager, just things like that, right? I went that route, and they had no, like, they had no idea. Like, they were like, who are you? We're not going to answer you. Like, it didn't matter. And then I hit up Despot. Despot put me in touch with Maria Rubin, Cole Schneider. Google them and poor and women. Um, and they were like, cool, he'll do it for $8,000 cash. Like you can meet us in the desert with the cash and like, and do the party. Um, back then we were like, what are we paying this guy this much money? You know what I mean? And then he ended up becoming like the legendary. Yeah. So that is what we did. Yeah, man, that's, that's, that is awesome. So that, so then y'all got him to do, uh, what was it? Coachella? Like, it was a Mountain Dew event okay. um, outside of Coachella, At, yeah. Outside, okay, yeah, so yeah. it wasn't in Coachella? It was, it was in the just, desert, but okay. it was, yeah. It's a Coachella party, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Man, that's dope as hell. And yeah. did y'all foster a relationship after that? Or no, was actually, I actually never met him, honestly. Wow. No, yeah, I mean, maybe, like, I had seen him, like, in Miami over time and mm -hmm. stuff like that and seen him around and stuff like that, but no, I didn't. I was too young to go to Coachella. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, I would have met him that day, but wow. I never met him, yeah. Yeah, that's the amazing part about all of this. Like, you were doing this at such a young age. Yes. <laughs> like, this is crazy. Like, when you talk about the the, the events that you were throwing with um, Trippy Red and mm -hmm. Ski Max and them, like, yeah, you yeah, were yeah. 18 around that yes, time. Yes, like, yes, I was, yes. It's insane. But um, just real quick, real quickly before we Thank wrapped you. up, um, I just want to highlight, um, you know, Rye Wave, obviously, because yes. um, when you were at Alamo, you were um, kind of responsible for bringing him over there. Um, if you kind of just want to walk through, like, um, I know we're time crunch right now. Yeah, I'll try to be as fast as possible. <laughs> um, okay, the Instagram explore page was, mm -hmm. like, still, like, about, like, what was trending in your area, okay? Mm -hmm. So, like, he did a video with Einer Banks. He must have had, like, 8,000 or 12,000 followers back then. I didn't know who Einer Banks was either, but, like, I pressed on the video, and he, like, could really sing. And, like, it, what he was talking about was, like, really emotional to me. You know what I mean? And, um... I'm musically trained, obviously, so it was, like, really, really cool. Um, and then I went to Tampa to try to go sign him, and, like, he wasn't really that sure, but, like, he was, like, really in a situation, you know what I mean? And then and then we ended up, you know, signing him at Alamo Records, and, um, and we, you know, fostered a really good relationship over time. He's still my friend. We still talk a lot, and I'm super proud of him. Yeah, and so that's kind of what you meant by when you say you wanted to cultivate this artist and label relationships. Oh yeah, I was the like, only person who could call him at one point in yeah. time. You know what I'm saying? Like definitely, yes. And and I guess to, to sum everything up is like, you know, when we talk about, when I ask you like, what can you bring differently? I mean, that's kind of it. Like you are able to bring um, that unique connection that you have with these artists to this label, you know, which a lot of these older people I think don't really understand, you know, cause they're more focused on business, which you are too, but you also understand that these are humans. <laughs> yes, I mean? exactly. Yeah. And I think like the trauma from dealing with what I dealt with has mm -hmm. helped me understand that even more. You know wow. what I mean? And so I know you tweeted. I'm going to read it to you. You tweeted a while and I quote, you said, I've been holding this back for a while, but since schools are closed in Palm Beach uh, County, my friends and I are starting a school and arts program where we're going to teach kids interested in learning wow. about all aspects of music two times a month and we'll have special guest speakers. I think that's dope. Did y'all ever continue that? Is that still a thing? The first person who reached out to me was Amine's manager. Shout mm -hmm. out to him. Um, what ended up happening with that? I think that I like definitely like opened up my messages and everything for people to reach out and mm -hmm. do things like that. 
I tried to go to my school actually I went to an art school and it was like funded privately funded by you know like people around there who wanted like kids to go to a good public school and they completely like denied everything that I wanted to do because I represent the hip-hop culture and wow. I don't think that they wanted to be like aligned with that mm. yeah will you ever see yourself doing that in the future Is that yeah absolutely and back? like by the way like if they would ever want to collaborate or do anything like I would get back at any moment absolutely mm -hmm. yeah yeah you do do that a lot too uh when I was just doing research on you I saw you were you were big on internships like you would you know who needs in I oh need yeah yeah who, yeah you know who, who does graphic design yeah. or something like that and you would just extend that out to people so yeah you definitely are like huge on trying to get kids who are interested in music to learn it you know um and and another thing um what what direction do you see for your label the um oh the gold music group yeah okay so infamous is signed to my label he's an artist that um i collaborated on with hot boy mm -hmm. um that drew filmed it actually brought in front of me shout out to drew and um he's an incredible lyricist he does a great job at you know posting the content he needs to post and moving around atlanta you know in a in a good way and i just believe that we're gonna foster like a really great career you know a career for him you know what mm -hmm. i mean like i don't ex i'm not gonna put the pressure on him to be the biggest but he wants to be the biggest and yeah. so therefore like it puts <laughs> pressure on me to make sure that the things get done you know what i mean uh i think in the future gold music will probably pivot to like a different branding mm -hmm. or like a different you know method of putting out this music and stuff like that and i think it'll be more like um hopefully it can be more like for everybody like open to everybody who is like interested in like you know me and my ways of working and my peers and the people that i have around yeah, yeah. and you've always shared interest in the latin space yes are you at any point gonna start bringing those acts oh yeah we got a lot of music coming out right yeah yeah we do yeah. nice yes now, do, can you share who the artists are that you're working with? Uh, man, I got, um, yeah. So th this is interesting, but I, I work with Malu Trevejo at Atlantic. She is the girl that, um, you know, she's big on Instagram, really, really big on Instagram and stuff like that. And, they, you know, she's making a lot of music in English. And I was like, yo, like, yo, why don't you just, like, tap into your Latin roots? And I feel like people are really going to, like, respect what you do here. Like, she speaks great English. I mean, great Spanish um we went to spain she made a lot of music in spain and now we have like great records with you know big artists out there and stuff like that um my best friend diablo and i have made like a lot of spanish records and stuff with different mm -hmm. acts um i don't know there's a there's a lot there's that a lot you'll see coming out yeah we'll do part two about it and we'll do it in spanish <laughs> or like that. Yeah. Uh, oh i just uh, shout yeah, out yeah. to my boy saucy who mm -hmm. is 17 years old posting on TikTok every day, going on live every day, and doing it both in Spanish and in English. He's gonna be the new generation wow. of what this uh, multicultural, genreless uh, bridge of this you know, global gap that I'm trying to bridge every single day. Like wow. kids like that, kids who like grew up in the United States speaking English, but whose parents know Spanish and they embrace both cultures and they bring maybe like fashion from the US into like this whole, you know, like, Colombian audience or mm -hmm. Mexican audience or Puerto Rican audience or whatever and like you know have both minds on at the same time like that's that's what's going to kill it 200% you're 100% Latino and 100% you know US and and that's going to be the new wave for sure 100% wow. <laughs> all right Mateo thank you man thank you for your time Absolutely. I really appreciate talking to you uh you know you can shout out Instagram and let them know where to follow you what you're working on just Mateo Dorado that. shout out to Elena for getting me the at <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, man. We'll see y'all on the you, next right. one. Thank Peace. you, guys.